What is lacking in our education today is uh, people's understanding that we are part of the natural world. And therefore it's very uh, important to teach children uh, about nature and help to reconnect them with nature by having education outside. And there are now whole schools where all the education is, or, or, or most of it, uh, occurs outside. And the, one of the biggest problems we have is that people have lost the connection with nature. So we need to, to start with uh, the education system. The reason we have so poor governance in the world is that our politicians do not understand that we are all a part of a, one system. And so systems thinking is another thing that needs to come into our education so that we understand that everything is connected. Uh, and this is not what uh, the major politicians appear to understand today. And, and that's why we have poor policies uh, and we are exceeding the ecosystem capacities. Now the, the Bhutanese talk about in their schools, and this is a policy they did, uh, uh, they've, they've, they start now their day and end their day with a, a, a silent meditation and, when, and they talk to the students about things like altruism and generosity and those, the importance of those things to GNH or to, to the happy life. How important is it to, for our Western educational systems to include some of that sort of thing too? I think that is crucial because it's very important for people to uh, learn to be in silence. I have heard from uh, Matthew Fox, who is a monk, who has been working with people in, in prisons, and he has found out that some of the uh, uh, most serious criminals he has worked with have never experienced silence. So see, he has been um, uh, teaching them meditation. He has also work, been working with children who are not doing well at school, both in California and Florida, and, and there by introducing a meditation at the beginning of, of uh, the school day, the, the children uh, be, yeah, become more, more confident and, and, and interested in the, in the school work. So I think meditation should be uh, at the beginning of everybody's day. And this is something I found for myself, you know. If I don't meditate at the beginning of the day, my day is not as good <laughs> as, as the day where I meditate myself. What drew you to this uh, this meeting and to what uh, Bhutan is doing here? How do, how does this excite you? What what is it maybe most about about this whole process of GNH that that inspires you? Well, I've been worried about where the world is going for a number of years, and and uh, GNH is actually the best story in town. The story is uh, helping us to understand that. Uh, money and, and, and stuff is not what makes us happy or, or makes us feel good. What actually uh, makes us feel good is, is, uh, is a community and, and, and working together. And uh, we need to learn to, to be happy with less because we are exceeding the capacity of the earth uh, to deliver the resources that we have been using so shamelessly um, in the past 50 years or so. Your country may have taken one of the biggest shocks from the financial crisis of any country mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, how, and so you had to deal with maybe a little less money. How has that affected uh, Iceland and does that have anything to say to the, to the GNH idea? When we had the financial crisis in Iceland in 2008, people uh, had overnight to, to learn to live with about half, half of the, the income they had before because everything is imported and the, and the currency was devaluated basically by about 100%. So uh, what people found is that instead of chasing the money, working too much and so on, they had more time with their families. And, and there is now evidence to show that our children are happier because they have more time with their parents.
and the, and the Icelandic people? Do you think they're as happy as before the financial crisis? <laughs> or do you have any sense? Well, I, I can tell you about the experience of one of my colleagues. He came back to Iceland after uh, studying and working in the United States uh, about two or three years before the financial crisis. And she didn't understand what had happened to her friends. And she had nothing in common with her, their friends. They, they, they didn't understand why they didn't rip everything out of their house and get a new kitchen and, and buy a new car, and <laughs> which is what everybody was doing, taking more loans to, to uh, making everything uh, look modern and, and fancy. And, and she said that almost every day she and her husband discussed, you know, can we actually live in this country? This, you know, we, we don't really understand what people are doing. And then she said after the crash, she found her friends back. They, they, some sanity had, <laughs> had come back to them and, and their focus was not as much on, uh, on wealth, uh, on stuff and things and having everything new. But, but more on uh, spending time together. What do you think the world could look like in 2050 if this process succeeds in a sense? What I see are sustainable communities all over the world that deliver um, education and jobs and, uh, and food uh, from the local uh, bioregion. I think we have to start to very soon to generate uh, most of our foods within the cities and that is already uh, research is going on on how to deliver that uh, in Europe and uh, I see that we are not traveling so much because uh, oil will be too expensive uh, we will spend more time at home but we will be connected with the outer world through modern technology. I think this is a, going to be a much happier uh, and, and more resilient uh, and healthy community than we have today.